Hey there yo. Today I'm going to continue where I left off on my first tips video. In that I went over the 1500 plus fighter tips and talked about the facts that I thought were interesting. So if you want to watch that feel free to. For today I'm moving on to the stages section, which does have considerably fewer tips in it, but I found that it still had enough potentially interesting content for me to make a video focused on it. Just like last video, this isn't meant to be a completely comprehensive list of every interesting fact found in the tips, but rather it's just a compilation of things that I thought were new that I hadn't really gone over on the channel before. As with anything like this, what determines whether or not a fact is interesting or new can only really be decided subjectively. So if there's anything in here that you already knew about, or things in the tips that you thought could have been mentioned, just make a comment down below. But I'll still try to use my judgement to keep things interesting. Also, I haven't said this in a while, but if you like this video, be sure to subscribe and keep supporting the channel. I really do appreciate it. Anyhow, let's just get into things. Before tackling the stages, there's one fighter tip I decided I really wanted to expand upon. For Link, there's a tip describing how, despite him being the protagonist of every game, his name only appears in five titles throughout the series. For those of you who are curious, those titles are Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link, A Link to the Past, Link's Awakening, a Link Between Worlds, and Link's Crossbow Training. This of course doesn't include rehashed versions of the same game, like Link's Awakening DX and such. It's an interesting tip, but in my opinion, 5 titles in a series isn't that off. It's a pretty modest number, even if Link technically deserves way more love than Zelda does, you know? But this got me thinking, what does this tip say in Japanese? As far as I had known before, none of these Zelda games actually have Link's name in it at all. And looking at it, we can see the related tip here. To offer my own loose translation, it's basically saying, in the Zelda series, the only two games that have the protagonist Link's name in the title are Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link and Link's Crossbow Training, which the tip is able to specifically reference as the list is now smaller. Having only two titles, one of which being a super low-key spin-off game, and the other being one of the more controversial Zelda games in the series, is definitely not as good of a run for Link's name. For those of you who are curious about the other titles, A Link to the Past is actually called something like Triforce of the Gods, and A Link Between Worlds is just Triforce of the Gods 2, and Link's Awakening is merely called Dreaming Island or something akin to that. Anyhow, I guess that's enough of the Japanese Zelda lore, let's move on to the stage tips. On Dreamland, the side of the stage that Wispy Woods will blow is determined by how many players are on a certain half. The more players are on a half of the stage is where he'll blow. It's worth noting that this isn't exactly half of the stage, but rather which half of Wispy Woods you're on. Which is why right here, despite us still being on the left half of the stage, Wispy Woods blows to the right side, because we're to his right. And in the case where the distribution of characters is evenly split between the sides, the side where he blows is chosen randomly. In training mode this isn't fully random, as the choices are consistent after resetting, like some other stage RNG elements, but that hardly matters in a real match. And even though the tips don't talk about it, everything I've just gone over seems to also apply to green greens. This is the type of thing that makes full sense, but I'd never really gone out of my way to confirm whether or not this is how this actually works. Next in Mushroomy Kingdom, there's actually a hidden block in the same place it was in the original 1-1 design, except it's just moved a single block lower, probably to just make it easier to access. In the original game it contains a 1-up, but in here it just acts like any other item block. Sometimes spawning a normal item, sometimes not. If you play the game with items on but have hazards turned off, you'll notice that you can't interact with any of the blocks and items will just spawn normally. And when you get to the hidden block you'll see that it's already been revealed and is left like that. Perhaps a good hint to its existence for those who didn't know before. Conversely, if you play with items off but hazards on, it's like before but now you can break the normal blocks. And once again the hidden block is left revealed. This is the default version of the stage when you go into training mode too, which implies that the game automatically assumes items are turned off, even if you spawn some in, which I guess makes sense. And this will actually come into play later. Next, a tip mentions how you can throw pellets into onions to get items. If you don't know, these colored and numbered discs are pellets, and these bug-like things are called onions. Throwing a pellet into an onion will spawn in a number of items. What number you get will actually depend on the number displayed on the pellet which is determined by how long you left the pellet be before attacking it. And it's also determined by whether or not the colors match. So matching colors with a 1 pellet will spawn 2 items, while unmatching colors will spawn 1 item. Whereas a 10 pellet of a matching color will spawn 3, and unmatching colors will spawn 2, and so on. 
And of course, if the item limit is met, then the pellet spawns nothing. This is another one of those things that I'm fully prepared to be told that is obvious, but I'd always seen pellets as just a fun projectile to throw at people during a match. And, you know, I've also never touched a Pikmin game in my life. So I actually hadn't known about this entire mechanic. Also, like before, it's worth noting that the pellets and the onions will not spawn if items are turned off, even if hazards are on. Which, again, echoes the rule set in training mode, meaning they don't spawn in there either. Oh, and actually, this isn't a tip, but while I'm here, Examine 63 had recently given me a fact about these pellets in Custom Smash. That is, if you're playing in a custom mode that changes the speed of the game in any way, when you release a pellet, it'll always turn into a red 1, no matter the color or number it was at previously. But if you throw it into an onion, you'll see that you get way more items than a red number 1 pellet would. This means basically that this glitch is only visual, and the effects of the pellets are still carried over. It's a bit confusing, I'm not sure why this happens, but it's pretty interesting. Anyhow, next, in a spear pillar tip, it mentions how one of Palkia's moves is cutting everyone's weight in half. I can only imagine they're referring to this section here. I'd always interpreted it as some sort of low gravity effect, only affecting fall speed, so knowing that it affects weight in general is interesting, but I was very curious about them saying it halves the weight. I wanted to see if this was actually the case. Jigglypuff's weight is basically half of Bowser's weight. And as we know, weight is the primary factor to how much knockback a character takes, which is why Puff gets KO'd at earlier percents than Bowser. So with all this known, if this section really halved weight, then something that KOs Jigglypuff normally should now be able to KO Bowser here, right? Which I am testing with POW blocks, these start KOing Puff at 120% exactly. But Bowser doesn't get KO'd at this percent, when in the weight loss section. He doesn't even get KO'd anywhere near this percent either. So the idea that his weight is halved is something that I doubt. So I wanted to see if I could figure out the real conversion. So here's the test. In the weight loss section, Bowser starts getting KO'd by Jigglypuff's up smash at 88%. We can figure out what his hypothetical weight would be here by seeing which other character starts getting KO'd normally at 88%. And the earliest weight I found that starts getting KO'd at this percent is Samus, with a weight of 108. Technically, Piranha Plant also starts getting KO'd at 88%, and their weight is 112, so this isn't exactly accurate, but it's at least a decent ballpark. I'll stick with Samus for now. To go from Bowser's 135 weight to Samus's 108 weight, this means that the multiplier has to be 0.8 times. So to just sort of confirm this, I did the same thing again. If you apply that multiplier to Samus's weight, you get something around 86, which is Sonic's weight. In the weight loss section, Samus barely starts getting KO'd at 75%, and for Sonic, in a normal setting, he starts getting KO'd at around 76%. It's not a perfect match, but it is pretty darn close. When I did it once again with Sonic and Jigglypuff, this time the numbers actually did add up perfectly, with Sonic starting to get KO'd at 65% in the weight loss section, which is the same time Puff starts getting KO'd normally. The numbers don't add up quite as evenly when I tested with the POW block, but overall it's still really close. So I think the 0.8 times multiplier is pretty accurate. Now take all of this with a grain of salt, this is mostly just my own conjecture. I don't know everything that there is that affects knockback. It's possible that low gravity has some sort of effect. But given what I currently know and what I've seen, I think the weight isn't being halved. Next, a tip on hand and bow mentions that making all of the leaves red on the right side of the screen makes a flower appear on top. At first I thought it meant the three leaves on the right side of the tree, but it does mean all six. And it actually can be a bit of a pain to get things organized to where all the leaves turn red, but it's also kind of fun actually. And yeah, once you do, the flower up top blooms. As far as I know, that's it. It doesn't have any unique effect or anything. If the leaves stop being red, the flower will slowly fade away and come back when the leaves are red again. It's pretty neat. It means the preview image of the stage may technically be a lie, since you can't get this flower effect without making the leaves red, but oh well. Next, a 3D land tip states how the question mark blocks can hold items, with super leaves appearing slightly more often than others. Now, when I turned all items on, I didn't get even a single super leaf from them, so it's not like it's super prevalent. So I only had two items on just to see, and out of six tests, four of them were super leaves. Yeah, not exactly hard proof or anything, but these are the only two question mark blocks on the entire stage, and I gotta finish all the transitions before I can test again. A more thorough form of proof would require more data, but I don't feel like sitting through this stage over and over again. And hey, the wiki echoes this fact, so I'm just gonna choose to believe it. 
related to this. A tip for Mario Maker describes how the question mark blocks will more frequently contain items from the Mario series than anything else. Again, I don't feel like going through the effort of gathering concrete data to prove this. But this is definitely something I've felt myself when using this stage. So I'll say it makes sense. Next, it's not exactly a fact, but in a gamer tip they say... Hide in the shadows if you don't want to be discovered smashing after bedtime. <laughs> I won't say anything else. Next, there's a few Duck Hunt tips that describe how the actual game of Duck Hunt works on the stage. Basically, if you shoot down all 10 ducks in a round, you'll get a bonus 10,000 points added to your score. And that's it. And there's only 9 total rounds. After the ninth round is over, they reset alongside your score. Uh, a bit heartbreaking. By the way, getting all of the rounds done perfectly got me 159,500 points. Nothing really happened, but it was actually kind of fun. I used Nessus PK Thunder for it, it was very effective. Next, a Pac-Land tip mentions how the stage's auto scroll will move faster or slower depending on where everyone is. If more people are on the half of the stage that the screen is moving towards, it'll move faster, as if to catch up to them. And if they're on the other side, the auto scroll will be slower, as if to let them catch up. And if characters are on both sides of the stage, it'll seem to just cancel out and go normally? A bit of a quality of life feature. As far as I know, no other auto scroll mechanic in the game acts like this. I think it's kinda nice. It's the type of thing where, again, I felt like I noticed it before, but never really went out of my way to confirm it. So it's nice to know for sure. Lastly, a new Donk City Hall tip mentions how Captain Toad will appear on a certain part of the stage every third time the battle goes to that part. So for me, this time, it was the final transition. And I bring this up because each cycle takes about two and a half minutes. Meaning to get to the third cycle, it would take five minutes. And potentially even more to get to the part with Toad. So I figured because of this, it could elude some people because the matches might not go on for that long. The tip also states how simply having music in the background that's related to Captain Toad causes him to appear in the background every cycle. Which, you know, makes him a lot easier to find, but, you know, it's Captain Toad music. I'm not even sure how many there are in the game. I think it's a pretty fun detail. So, I think that's everything I want to go over for today. The stage tips overall were alright, but I felt like that they were really inconsistent. Like, 3D Land has a whopping 10 tips about it. While PictoChat 2 only has one tip that vaguely describes the fact that it has obstacles. And Gerudo Valley also only has one tip, completely ignoring the existence of Kotake and Kome. And so on. But yeah, I thought it was pretty interesting. I felt like it was less satisfying than the fighter tips, but that's mostly because a lot of the things that I didn't know about beforehand weren't because they were super obscure yet interesting, but it's because there's over 100 stages while most folk only use a handful of them, you know? So it was like... New didn't necessarily mean fascinating, but it was still pretty interesting, I think. And regardless, I did learn plenty of new things, and I hope you did too. At this rate, I'll probably make a final episode just to wrap things up. I have no idea how many interesting facts will be in the remainder of the tips, but be sure to subscribe if you want to watch that or anything else on the channel. Also, by the time I've uploaded this, it's Christmas Eve. So for those of you who celebrate, happy holidays. Stay safe, treat each other well, enjoy your time, all that. And I'd like to thank my patrons Scully, Burbo, Hobo King Nichols, Rain, Sevillon700, and everyone else for their support. Stay casual, and I'll see y'all later.